make life fun and they make life enjoyable. And at times they also uh, just befuddle us. Who is it I'm talking about? It's our friends. When you find a true friend, you really find a great blessing. Sometimes those friends come early on in life and they stay with us uh, throughout life. Sometimes our friends come later on in life and sometimes for whatever reason we have friends, but they just come in and out of our life. And yet uh, when they are in our life, they are very precious. And when uh, we maybe go on in a little different direction, they are precious to us. We just don't spend time with them and we miss them dearly. Well, I'm sure we all have probably to a degree in our life, we have those individuals, those individuals that are precious to us. And oftentimes we we categorize friends as really anybody that we have any kind of relationship with. You know, we'll talk about somebody and we'll say, my friend so-and-so or my friend down the road, my friend that I work with. And, and that's not wrong. By any stretch of the imagination, if you understand that there are levels of friendship. But let's talk about tonight the level of being a true friend. Who is a true friend? What does the Bible say about being a true friend? A true friend, first of all, is someone who loves you through whatever. This is the person that loves you all the time. You know, God has called his people to be loving people, hasn't he? Walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. That's what Paul told the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. That's what Christians are really known for and known as. By this shall all men know, Jesus said, that you are my disciples if you have what? Love one for another. Well, that would, of course, include friendships, not just acquaintances, not just brethren that make up the family of God, that make up the church where uh, we worship. But also, we understand that love is that bond that binds us together, that holds us together. Well, let's understand love for just a second. What is love? Well, love's a lot of different things, and I don't know that you can really successfully, in one sentence, define love. But one of the the best definitions that uh, I ever saw for love is really a description of love. And the definition that was given was, love is when you desire the very best for someone else. That's powerful in my way of thinking. This friend that loves us, that we as friends love them, we want what is very best for our friends. And we'll love them through whatever they go through. They're not fair weather. Love's not fair weather. It's not here today and gone tomorrow. You know, the old adage, and it's probably true just about anywhere, but the old adage in Tennessee, if you don't like the weather now, just wait five minutes and it will change. Well, that's the way some people treat us. And yet, the Bible says, no, no, no. Love is not fair weather. Remember, we talked about this morning, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 defines love. And he tells us that love suffers long. In other words, love is long-suffering, that it is patient, that it's always there. And he goes on in verse 8, and he says, love bears all things. The word bears there has the idea of protect, to protect by covering, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It remains even under the the greatest of burdens and under times in which we might scratch our head and say, you know, I don't know that I want to be with them in, in this endeavor. Love never fails, Paul said, even as they act in ways beyond our reasonable understanding. The word fails there is interesting. When you trace the history of it, it's the idea of actors being hissed off of a stage. And so it says that even when folks are hissed off a stage, love stays with it. Well, you might say, well, that's the love that we're to have for God. Absolutely. 
But it's also the love that we need to have for our friends. It's a commitment. A friend loves at all times, Solomon said in Proverbs 17 and verse 17. A friend loves all the time. When we think about loving us and loving us whenever uh, and through whatever, we understand Paul and a friend that he had by the name of Onesiphorus. You might call him Onesiphorus. I call him Onesiphorus. And either way that you want to pronounce that is correct according to what I've been able to study through the years. But Onesiphorus, Paul claimed in Second Timothy chapter 1, he said, May the Lord have mercy upon the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me, not being ashamed of my chains. And evidently it's believed, because there's only a couple of biblical citations of Onesiphorus, that Onesiphorus was a friend of Paul's and that when Paul was in Roman imprisonment, talking about being in chains, that Onesiphorus came and Onesiphorus came and ministered somehow to him, whether it was he brought him stuff or he spent spent a little time with Paul or he ministered to his needs or doctored him. We're not exactly sure. But notice what he said. For he oft refreshed me. He often refreshed me, not being ashamed of my my chains, not being ashamed of where I was. That is being a true friend. A true friend, then, loves us through whatever. But secondly, a true friend sticks close no matter what takes place. We need people to walk into our lives. We need people to stay in our lives when others walk out. And that's what good friends do, isn't it? Good friends walk into our life, share in our life, and stay in our life when there are even others that are walking out. I know of an individual once that served as in the capacity of a, of a deacon congregation. He had expressed some things that he felt uh, with regards to uh, some doctrinal issues. I think some, personally, I think it was some things he was trying to work through. But at the same time, too, it was for an extended period of time. And so he approached the elders And the elders talked to him, and he talked to the elders about that. And the elders then, knowing that the preacher was close to him, asked him to go see this man and talk to him. And he did. And as he talked to the man, when when the preacher left, the man then talked to his wife, and the wife later confided in the preacher And so she asked her husband, she says, what do you feel now? And he says, I feel like my good friend came and talked to me. That's what a friend does. He sticks close no matter what's taking place. Man at times wanders, doesn't he? Man at times has personal matters come up. Distance takes away from the relationship. There are things that happen that create a rift between folks. But true friends stick together no matter what. You know, friends from time to time will not see eye to eye. And when they don't see eye to eye, they really have one of two choices, don't they? Walk away from the the relationship or say, okay, I love you, is in our first point. I forgive you. I ask for your forgiveness. But I want to still be friends. It's not easy to stick with folks. And it's not easy to stick with folks all the time. We're reminded and should remember what Solomon said in Proverbs 18 and verse 17. In which he said, the first one to plead his call seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. You ever thought about that? None of us think we're wrong, do we? You know, sometimes my wife and I, and I believe my wife to be a very smart lady. My wife and I, in our conversation, she'll say something and I'm thinking, now that's not quite right. Then a lot of times as we begin to examine it, uh, she is quite right. 
But we always think that we're right because when I took the other side of that discussion, I thought I was right. And then when we get to looking at it, well, you know, no, Paul wasn't right. The reality of it is, is we all think that of ourselves. And sometimes when friends come to that, they have to understand that they have to still stick together even though they disagree. Isn't that what Solomon said in Proverbs 18 and verse 24? A man who finds friends must himself be friendly, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He sticks with us through thick and thin. Somebody sent me one day a poem uh, by email, and it simply read this. And I, I don't remember, I don't memorize a lot of poems, but I thought this one was so good. It said, me and you as friends, when you smile, I smile. When you hurt, I hurt. When you cry, I cry. When you jump off a bridge, it's been nice knowing you. Well, <laughs> you'd have to know the relationship that I and this individual had. It was a tremendous relationship. That's, though, the epitome of so many friends. But friends, true friends, stick close, no matter what takes place. Now, that's not to say, and I'm not in saying that if your friend uh, creates and does bodily harm to themselves, that you should as well. But it is to say, stick with them. Hold their hand when you can. But then thirdly, a true friend tells you what you need to hear. Did you hear that? A true friend tells you what you need to hear. We may always think we're right, but we're not always right. Job's friends came to him. And Job's friends told them, or told him, that the reason he was suffering was because of his sin. Now, we know, first of all, that that teaching is contradictory to the will of God. That God does not cause bad things to happen to us because we sin. The, what's called the theory of retribution. God does not try to get even with us. That's not the way God operates. The second thing is, is that in Job chapter 1, we realize in verse 1 following that Job is a tremendously good man, an upright man, one that fears God and has no part with evil. And so, the, when Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar come to talk to Job, and their accusation is, is Job, you sinned and therefore you're wrong, or therefore you, you're suffering what you've suffered, the loss of all that you suffered. Job keeps saying, y'all aren't right. And he tells them, he says, you all are miserable comforters. Elihu then joins into the picture, and Elihu seems to be a young, bold man, young man, that for whatever reason thinks he knows all the answers. And in reality, he really doesn't. And his argument is really the same as the former friends. You know, when he pops on the scene, he says, now they didn't know anything, but listen to me, I have the answers. And then lo and behold, he doesn't say the same thing. So sometimes friends, when they tell us stuff, may be wrong. But yet at the same time, too, friends will tell us what we need to hear, whether we like it or not. Paul asked the question of the church of Philippi, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? One of the sad but true things is, is that sometimes folks turn on preachers when all preachers have done is tell them the truth. Preachers have preached the truth to them. Preachers have talked to them about the truth, and they didn't want to hear it. And they consequently turned on the preacher. Well, I wonder if we do that to our friends. Now, we have to understand that there's tremendous difference between telling us what we want to know and telling us what we need to know. What we want to know may be flattery, but what we need to know is what's true and what's right. Friends, then, are brutally honest with us. They're not yes men. They don't stab us in the back. They really, they stab us in the front, if you will. Solomon addressed this again in the book of Proverbs, chapter 27, verses 5 and 6. 
in which he says, open rebuke is better than love, carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You see, Solomon says, an enemy may butter you up, but a friend will tell you and tell you the truth. We need to remember to tell the truth, to tell the truth to our friends, even when they don't like it, to do it lovingly, of course, to do it with great grace and compassion, to do it with great kindness. We still need to tell folks the truth. It was said of Jesus that he stirred up the people throughout all of Judea in Luke 23, verse 5. The Pharisees brought that accusation against Jesus. The reality of it was is that it was true. How do you receive and can you receive that which folks criticize you with? With anger? With contempt? Are you defensive? Or do you listen and do you consider and do you appreciate what they've told you? And then if a change is necessary, do you make that change? A true friend will tell you what you need to hear. And what you need to do then in turn is listen. But then fourthly, a true friend, they really make you a better person. Their example, their words, their counsel, their beliefs, their ways just seem to shine the light of Christ not only in their little area of the world, but into our lives as well. They work on us. They make us better. The story is told. You've probably heard the story. The story is told of a little girl that she died. And some of her classmates wanted to eulogize her at her funeral, which the family allowed them to do. And when they did, one little girl got up and said of her little friend that had passed away, she made everyone better. Boy, that's a strong statement, isn't it? She made everyone better. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, Solomon said in Proverbs 12, verse 26, for the way of the wicked lead them astray. We need to be careful. That we choose friends that will make us better. Why? Well, didn't Solomon address this again in the book of Proverbs where he says that iron sharpens iron? So a man's countenance sharpens his friends, we could thus conclude. Well, we understand, and those of you that have been working in your garden probably in the last little bit, if you haven't, maybe you have in the past, you know that when you get your hoe out, You take that hoe and you take your file and you file on it a little bit to make it sharp when you go out in the garden so that you can cut the weeds down. Or you sharpen your your shovel or you sharpen the knives in the kitchen. What do you do? You're often rubbing iron, if you will, against iron, metal upon metal to make your knives, your hoes, your shovels sharp. Friends sharpen each other up. Evil communications, evil companionship, depending upon the version that you're talking about now, but it's the same verse, 1 Corinthians 15.33. Evil company corrupts good habits. We need to be careful. Think with me for a minute about one of my favorite texts in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John had healed man. There were the accusations then that they had done something terrible. And when they they had, they gathered Peter and John and they questioned them. And they were trying to bring an accusation against them. But it says in verse 13 of Acts chapter 4, when they saw that they were unlearned, untrained, uneducated men. Now, I've added a few words there. But it says, the text then says, that they marveled and took knowledge of them. Who's the them? Peter and John. That they had been with Jesus. 
Now here's here's what happened. Peter and John are giving a defense of themselves and a defense of the gospel to these folks that are asking them why did they do what they did and, and how they did and what was the import of what they did. And so Peter and John, in their defense, these folks realized as they questioned them, oh, yeah, for three years, these two fellows have been with Jesus and they're acting just like him. They're answering just like he would answer. They're talking just like he would talk. What had happened? I thoroughly believe that for those three years that Peter and John were with Jesus, Jesus made them better. And as Jesus made them better, as Jesus, if you will, improved them just by being Jesus and them being with him, he was one of their, if not the best, the absolute best friend that they had. We need to be careful. We need to understand that I am and I do and I feel and I am better because of those that I'm around. Good friends. Oh, we love them. Good friends make life enjoyable. And I'm grateful for my good friends. And I know I'm sure that you are as well. A little girl one time was counting her money. She had opened up her piggy bank. She'd poured her money out on the floor. She was counting her money. Her father was in the same room with her, and she looked up, and she said, Dad, I'm rich. And he looked at the coins, and he wanted to go along with her, but he knew that there weren't very many coins there. And he said, Why, yeah, honey, you are rich, but why do you say that? And she said, Because I have lots of good friends. (laughs) That little girl knew something about friendship, didn't she? And the value and the importance of friends. But it, then as we conclude this lesson, let me give you a, a one great hint that somebody gave me a long time ago. And I think is in a scripture that we've already seen bound up in it. It's simply this. The best way to have a good friend is to be one. We thank you for listening. We hope that you have a good friend. We hope that you'll make your life such that you are a good friend to others, no matter who they are and no matter how much you can interact with them. Thank God for good friends. May God bless you and keep you as our prayer. I hope you have a fantastic week. And until we are able to meet again through this means, and that will be Wednesday night at 6.30. May God bless you and keep you as my prayer. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate that uh, message tonight. At this time, we're going to turn it back over to Jim and let him lead us in another song. So, Jim, if you'd unmute and lead us in that song, please. Number 680 in your book to go along with Paul's lesson, There's Not a Friend. Number 680, There's Not a Friend. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an eye that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one, no, not so dark that his love can cheer us. No, not one, no, not one, Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate you uh, 
leading singing not only this morning, but also tonight. Really appreciate that. Thank you. At this time, we're going to turn it over to George Walker, who will uh, close us out in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this time, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for the time we've had to be together. But also, Father, we thank you for the friends, our brothers and sisters. And, Father, we pray that you'll look down on us. Help us, Father, that we may continue to encourage, we may strengthen, and help each other whenever we have the opportunity. As the Bible says, a friend, that if you have friends, you must show yourself friendly. So, Father, it starts with us, and if people see that in us, they will want to be friends with us. Father, we thank you for the ones that's had surgery, for Buck and Penny and Shirley Ray, that they did good. We pray your blessings to continue to be with them and help them to recover. But, Father, there's other surgeries coming. Be with each one of those that's got those scheduled, Father. Help them that they may be able to go through this and get the relief that they want. But, Father, we have several other people that are not on our list that are having problems. We ask your blessings to be with them also. You know who they are. But, Father, we thank you for the lessons we've had today to encourage us, to help us to stop and look and think and realize we should base our lives on what you have in your word. Father, we thank you for the singing today. Thank you for Jim that's led us. Pray your blessings continue to be with him and his family. Also, Father, if each and every person on here and as a church this morning, we thank you for each one of those. Father, we thank you for each person that calls in and is a part of this worship service today and each time. We appreciate all of them, no matter where they are or what they're doing. If they take time out to worship you, we say thank you to them. And now, Father, be with our congregation. Help us that we may have our ears open and our eyes open, that we may use each opportunity that we have to try to encourage other people. But, Father, be with our country, our leaders. Help them to rule in a way that your will will be carried out, not what we want, but the things that you want that would be best for us. Be with those that's working on a vaccine for the virus. Help them, Father, that they may get this as soon as possible. But help them, Father, that when they do, that it may be a safe vaccine that will be good for us to take. Father, we've had several that have lost loved ones. Bless those families. Comfort them. Give them courage as they go from day to day. We know you love them. We have no doubts about that. But help us, Father, to show love and kindness also. Now, Father, continue to be with us, guide us, and help us to be your example. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I hope that uh, you can be back with us Wednesday night at 630 for our Wednesday night devotional time together. And then again next Sunday at 10 a.m. We will be uh, in person at the church building and hope you can be there. If you can't, you can listen in on this uh, same phone line. But we're glad you were with us today. Hope you have a wonderful week and may God bless you and your family and may God continue to bless the River Road Church of Christ. Good night.